This is my father-in-law, Albert. He was born in Boston, played the clarinet in college, two kids. He spent his career in public relations, mostly, in New York, where my wife grew up. Five years ago, Albert came to our home to die. Diabetes, kidney failure, high blood pressure, dementia. Eventually, it was clear to Albert and to his doctors that he was outnumbered. So on a beautiful fall day, we set up a hospital bed in the den and called a hospice program to help us out. My brother-in-law came in from North Carolina to be with his dad. We didn't know what to expect. My wife Liz is a doctor, so medically she was in familiar territory. But this was her father. To bring him home so ill with our two young daughters, this was very new. Hey, Hannah. Hi, Who's in the den? Huh? Ben Velvet. Yeah. How come he's back there? Because he's sick. I suppose we were most concerned about the effect on our kids. But in the end, they were the ones who convinced us that we had done the right thing. They were very sad that he was so sick, and we made it clear to them that he was dying. But they weren't frightened. As Liz and I watched what was happening in our home, we knew that this was very different from any death we had ever known. When Albert died, Hannah, who was five at the time, wanted to see him and asked if she could touch his arm. We sat for a long time next to his bed. Oh, yeah. Now, five years later, Liz and I look back on Albert's death in our home as a positive experience for our family. It was a profoundly sad time as well. Yet once we were convinced that Albert's death was inevitable, we found that there were choices we could make that would greatly affect his last days. I began to wonder if it was always possible for someone to choose how they or their loved ones were going to die, and why so few of my family and friends had chosen to die at home. So I headed off on something of a journey, in search of a good death. I contacted two Chicago area hospice programs, Horizon Hospice, which helped us care for my father-in-law, and Hospice of the North Shore, another of the more than 100 hospices in Illinois. I spent time with some of the people who spend their days caring for people who are dying, the doctors, nurses, social workers, chaplains, and others who make up the team. I also got to know six hospice patients and their families. I think the best way to summarize a death in America is to say that it is needlessly bad. Um, about 40 to 70 percent of Americans die in pain. Uh, about 83 percent of Americans die in healthcare institutions rather than at home, as many prefer. 
Uh, about 50% of Americans have significant suffering before they die, meaning that they spend a substantial amount of time in an intensive care unit or are comatose or have other significant problems in the period just before their death. When Americans are asked, what does a good death mean to you? And what do you really care about when it comes to the, the care you receive at the end of your life? The so-called big three are not suffering, you know, not being in pain or having other worrisome symptoms, uh, not being alone, people don't want to die alone, and being at home. So if that's the kind of death we want, why aren't we getting it? One reason is that most of us could do a better job of taking control of our own health care. Sometimes taking control comes down to simply saying no. They came in and they said, Phyllis, you have a ovarian cancer. And it was like three doctors came in, each separately. And it was like total disbelief. I mean, how could I have ovarian cancer? There's no cancer in my family. My father lived to 95. My mother lived to 88. And the first thing I thought was, oh my God, Gilda Radner died of it. And there's no cure. They told me there's no cure. They can maybe prolong my life, but they can't cure it. Phyllis tried nearly two years of chemotherapy and surgery. But one day in the basement of the hospital, she was faced with a tough decision. So you're down in the x-ray room and I'm feeling lousy and I'm huddled in a chair and I'm freezing and I'm all alone except for when they come to x-ray me. And I thought, you know, what is going on here? I felt wonderful before. I mean, I really, except for being very tired, getting tired easily, I really felt not terrible in, in spite of the cancer. And I, on the way up, I decided, no way, no more. I said, I'm through with chemo. I am through. I am not doing it anymore. I don't even know what you could give me anymore, but I'm not going through this anymore. This is ridiculous. Along the way, as you go through treatments, there has to be an opportunity for folks to tell their doctors and their nurses how they weigh the burden and benefit of what, what's happening to them. You know. You, to, to start into medical care, you feel like you're out of control sometimes. You're getting these treatments and your hair's falling out and you feel off when you got diarrhea and, you know, stop the, the craziness. Right, I know I'm going to, I'm terminal. I mean, I, there's no doubt about it. I'm never going to be in remission, according to the doctors. Uh, I'm going to die. Hi, Megan. Come Hi, in, come in. How Good to see you. Mwah. I got lipstick on you. Oh, that's okay. You the first time I met with Phyllis, it was very brief. We just met and talked. She kind of gave me a brief overview of what she wanted to see towards the very end of her life. Things that were concerning her, um, like pain management, making sure that she's comfortable, making sure that she wasn't um, going to die with any kind of suffering. Hospice is a, a more a philosophy of care than a site of care. So in other words, hospice emphasizes the, uh, the relief of pain and suffering uh, ra rather than emphasizing the elimination of the disease that's causing the pain and the suffering. And it is quite well covered by Medicare as well. Hospice care usually, more than 80% of the time in our country, is delivered in patients own homes. There's a misconception that folks still in this country often think of hospice as a place that you go to die rather than a philosophy of care that embraces you and your family to help you live. <laughs> it's kind of a 180. This isn't about dying. This is about living with quality when we know your life is limited. What are you going to do? I mean, either you give up or you go on. What, should I sit in a chair and cry all the time? That's ridiculous. I feel better when I'm out doing things. It's not going to change the cancer. It isn't going to change. It's going to be there.
Ray Souza became a priest in the late 60s. Since 1992, he's been a chaplain for Horizon Hospice in Chicago. <laughs> hey, Miles. Hi, baby. Hi, Mocha. Hi. Hi. Ray visits nine or ten patients each week. Today, he's visiting Miles Eddy. Good dog. Good dog. Ray may be a chaplain, but that doesn't mean they only talk about God and religion. Usually, it's just whatever is on Miles' mind. Do you miss working? Yeah. yeah. Work was uh, kind of a, a pipeline to sanity, you know? I don't know what a chaplain's job really is. It's more like we're just friends. We're just friends. He's, uh, I reflect, he listens. He reflects, I listen. <laughs> Miles was diagnosed with lung cancer five years ago. When it spread to his brain, he had surgery to remove the tumor, but that left him without the use of one leg. And now it's pretty tough for him to get around, even with his walker. Well, I'll tell you, being sick and being put in a position where you may, may feel as though you can't have things as quickly or as the way you'd like them, it's got to be really rough. Well, it's like, you know, it's like sitting in the living room in the evening and watching TV. Mm -hmm. Well, I know my wife is here. I'll be sitting in there and I want a, a, a can of pop in the worst way. Mm -hmm. But I want that sucker for maybe an hour or two even <clears throat> because I hate to call her oh. and say, Bring me a can of pop, because it's like I should be able to do this. Miles lives on the northwest side of Chicago, not too far from the neighborhood where he grew up. He lives with his wife, Griselle, and her daughter, Sidey. Miles worked as a mechanic for the Chicago Transit Authority before he got too sick. He's been in hospice for a while now, longer than anybody expected. We signed up last year, and hospice care is usually for six or less months. We are going to be one year in a couple weeks in hospice care. Another celebration, huh? <laughs> I, basically, he's just proving everybody wrong, you know? That's just it. I think what I wanted more than anything was to give my wife a peace of mind be able to keep up with her life to sure. do what she wanted, you know. I see, yeah. Miles had a wonderful nurse, and she would call me every week after she visited with him and let me know his status and give me my moral support. Okay, how are you doing? And that's all she needed to say. Every time somebody's here, I feel better. You know, the, the chaplain is great, the social worker is great, the RNs have all been wonderful, the CNAs, they give you a, they don't give you a feeling like you're imposing, they give you a feeling like, you, you know, you belong here, this is what we need to do to keep you here. Now we're all together with you and try to, to address some of these concerns. Well, we need to get... We need to get a few more people on staff to, we need some landscaping. <laughs> need some carpentry. All right. <laughs> We're going to have to need really enlar enlarge our yeah, hospice have staff with a few more talents there. We're going to have to recruit some people <laughs> yeah. here, you know. Yeah. But, uh, well, it's about creating a system of care that allows each individual in their family to be able to articulate the kind of experience they want at the end of their lives and in working with their health care providers to achieve it. And the good news is that it's usually possible to do that. It's usually possible to respect people's wishes. If they want to die at home, it's usually possible to arrange that. If they want to be free of pain, 95% of the time, the pain can be made to go away without killing the patient. If they want to have their family near them, if they want to go to church, if they want to have their financial affairs in order, if they want some advance warning about when they're going to die, it's usually possible to provide these things. 
What Miles and Phyllis showed me is that it is possible to have more control over how we spend our last days, even if it means facing the fact that they are our last days. But when you ask for that kind of control, you're also asking to be involved in some of the tough decisions we used to leave up to our doctors. The next person I met was Leo Isaac. I was surprised to learn that even though Leo is in a nursing home, he could still be a hospice patient. I went to see him with his hospice nurse, Kathy DeLeo. Good morning, Good Kathy. Good morning, Leo. Sorry I was late today. I got stuck by a train the second time in all the times I've come to visit you today. <laughs> so. As long as you just got stuck and not struck. That's right. <laughs> That's right. I was immediately taken by Leo. As I watched Kathy examine him, I was amazed at how readily he welcomed me into his life. Leo Isaac was born and raised in Worcester, Massachusetts. He and his wife Florine spent most of their adult lives in Benton Harbor, Michigan, where they were active in many local organizations and well known as the founders of the area's Blossom Time Festival. Florine died three years ago. Leo's charm and accomplishments were not lost on local broadcasters. They asked me at the radio station to, to, if I'd like to go to work for them. I said, well, I've never been in radio, but I certainly like to try it. So I tried it, but it didn't work out. I was only there for 22 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Leo has ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. ALS, as you may know, is a deterioration of the muscles, and that's the big problem. <laughs> that's one of the reasons I can't hold my head up. The muscle isn't strong enough, and eventually, It'll get down into my stomach, and the esophagus, which is also a muscle, and I'll no longer be able to eat. It's a, a blessing and a curse to be that aware of your condition when you're in his position. Uh, it's a blessing because he's still a great communicator. He, he did that for much of his professional career. But it's a curse that, uh, that he knows every step of the way what's happening to him. And uh, um, he can, you know, he's involved in the decisions. Part of this disease is such, there's such loss of control. And so what we always try to do is give patients as much control over their lives as possible, even in the smallest of things. You know, what you want to wear today, what you want to eat, you know, do you want this cushion? Does this make you feel more comfortable? How about an egg crate mattress? Little things. But when he says no, that's it. Even though I might feel differently about what it will offer him, it's still his decision. I'm experiencing my biggest fear right now, and that is the loss of this left arm. Because for months, that's all I've had. And if I lose that, I become a paraplegic. Mm -hmm. And like I've told you and just about everybody else, I'm not afraid of death nearly as much as I'm afraid of becoming totally disabled. That's my biggest fear. Now his doctors have said, you know, you really don't have to worry about that because before that happens, the breathing goes and the ability to absorb 
uh, nutrients into your body goes na any, in a, any natural way. And something else that I noticed on the chart, the social worker, we had asked you about a G-tube. Kathy explained to me later that a G-tube is a feeding tube that puts nutrients directly into the stomach when a person is not able to eat. But I don't think that's my problem. Swallowing is a little bit of a problem. But my biggest problem is getting it to my mouth. Right. When a G-tube was mentioned to him, he, um, despite previously being quite uh, assertive about not wanting such things, he began to say, well, you know, I, I can't really make up my mind about that until I know more about it. I'm not sure that you're aware of the fact that having a G-tube will prolong your life and at the same time the disease continues to progress. If he has ALS and he opts to have a feeding tube placed, it definitely will support his body functions for a longer period of time. And around that support, he will gradually die, in a sense. You know, he, it, his worst fear could be realized that he, still intact in his brain, would watch this body just kind of revolt and disappear around him and not be able, be locked in that and not be able to say this isn't what I want and not being able to communicate. And that really, I think ALS is one of the toughest illnesses in that regard because the brain is still there and, and the body is in total mutiny against the brain. So it's a lot to think about, you know? Yeah. And I think about it a lot. Yeah. But, but it's like a, a phrase I've been using for since I was diagnosed. You have to play the cards you're dealt. Mm -hmm. A good hand, of course, would be better than a bad one, but if you do get a bad one, you still have to play the game. <clears throat> yes. Even though most hospice patients are cared for in their homes, there are times when it just gets to be too much. Some hospices have inpatient units in hospitals. The goal is still comfort care, but there's a little more help on hand. Martha Twaddle is the medical director of the Hospice of the North Shore. She makes rounds regularly at the inpatient unit. Hello. Hi, sweetheart. Hi. I'm Dr. Twaddle. I'm one of the hospice docs. How are you? Is this your lovely wife? <laughs> Some patients come into the hospice unit to spend their last days or weeks. Florence Lee came in hoping to get some of the symptoms of her lung cancer under control and go back home. How are you feeling today? Well, I'm feeling pretty good. Good. <coughs> comfortable? Yeah, I'm comfortable too. Good. How's your strength? Have you been able to get out of bed at all? You've been pretty much... Well, I haven't been out of bed but once a day. Okay. And that's to take a bath. And... How'd that go? Mm -hmm. Was it, that all right, or it, did you have any discomfort? It, no. Uh -uh, no discomfort. It was okay with even it the bath? It was okay. Good. Mm -hmm. Are you sleeping okay it, at night? Yeah. I'm the type of person, you know, when I go to sleep, I'm dead. So, I don't know. Nothing wakes you up, huh? No, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> Nothing you, wake me up. Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are you waking up other people? Yeah. I keep them guessing. Do you? <laughs> All these you years. You don't blame me, do you? No, I don't. That's part of the mystery of marriage. <laughs> <laughs> keep them guessing. Keep them guessing. <laughs> do you have any concerns? No. Things are okay? Yeah, so okay. far so good. Yeah. You let us know if there's anything we can do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll be here. We're listening, all right? Mm -hmm. Be here when? All the time. <laughs> it's either me or the nurses, but there's always somebody around if you need something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're never a bother, so you let us know. Mm-hmm. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, it's wonderful to meet you. You, you look so familiar do to I? me. All right, well, After rounds were over, I went back in and talked with Mr. and Mrs. Lee. 
I asked Mr. Lee why they decided it was time to come into the unit. She got sick. I was in the back of the house working, and I went up in the front. And she slept over in the chair, and I couldn't get her woke. What did you think when you first, when you went in and saw her? I didn't know what to think. I almost had a heart attack because she just slumped over. Mm -hmm. And when I was uh, trying to wake her up, she didn't respond. She mm -hmm. just said, yeah. I didn't know where she was on her way out or what. To, uh, so you decided it was time to, to yeah, bring time, her? Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't deal with nothing like that. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm no doctor and didn't know what to do. <laughs> Before I give up, I will tell you this. I love him 100% and will always love him. Thank you. Oh, you know I do. <laughs> Mrs. But I do, yes. Uh, we've been married for so many years, but if anything would happen to him, I don't want no other man, no other one, no. Are Take sure? him away from me because I had a beautiful life with this one. And I'm not going to get another one with a beautiful life back I did with him. No. Uh-uh. No. Mr. Lee, what's it been like for you caring, taking care of your wife at home? Oh, I get tired sometimes, but I feel happy and glad I've, and here I can take care of her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's kind of tired, you know, because I'm not used to just sitting, you know, and to see her go down like that, and we've been knowing each other since it was kids, and she had never been sick mm. like that before. <laughs> oh, it kind of wears me down, but uh, I won't give up. No. You planning on going back home? Mm -hmm. I think she'll be going yeah. back this weekend. Yeah. I'm going to say tomorrow, or one day this week, with the uh, nurses one minute put her in a home, but I don't want her because they said I couldn't uh, take care of her mm -hmm. in her condition. But I'm going to try anyway. I could never have found a beautiful, beautiful person like J.C. He has a beautiful personality. I know it. <laughs> J.C., I tell him to cut that out because I'm telling the truth. And he can't cut across me. Okay. Now, I'm not going to say anything good about you no more. Okay. It's going to be the bad thing. <laughs> you don't know nothing bad. Oh, boy. Well, well, I think that's the end of the line. Mm. Okay. I don't have anything else to say. <laughs> Seeing the two of them together, sharing her last days and celebrating their lifetime love, made me realize that the role of caregiver can be more than just a responsibility. It can be an honor and a source of deep satisfaction. It can also be a final act of love. Our first date was so wonderful, I was scared to death, so I met him. <laughs> we met at a restaurant, and we sat for hours, and this sweet, dear man looked at me and said, do you think you know how to cook? You know, he asked me such questions. I said, well, maybe, hon, you know. He looked at me and he said, I have to tell you something. And I said, okay. And he said, I had cancer seven years ago. And I looked at him and I said, so? <laughs> he said, what, what am I supposed to do? And he said, that won't stop you. I said, no. Bob and Marlene were married a year later. Okay, you too, Bob. This was the second marriage for both of them. As Bob's daughters got up to make their toasts and Marlene's sons followed, the one thing in the back of everyone's mind had to be Bob's health. Would his lung cancer stay in remission long enough for them to enjoy this marriage? The cancer did stay in remission, but only for two years. Marlene says they were the two best years of her life. 
With chemotherapy and radiation, they held the cancer at bay for three more years. But eventually, Bob was just too weak to fight it. For Marlene, the next big struggle was letting go. The last six months was very hard for him. He was down 145 pounds from 220. He couldn't write, he couldn't walk. He was just happy if I was there. But little by little, he just went down more and more. I think it took a long time to shift gears from we're going to fight the good fight, we're going to beat this thing, to we're not going to beat this thing this time. And I think it was really hard for her to even contemplate the idea that the goal should be to provide Bob with a good death because she just couldn't bear to think of him dying at all. You think you're intelligent and you think, okay, you do know, you hear what people are saying, but in your heart of hearts, you just can't give it up and you don't want to let him go. Marlene was determined to care for Bob at home. She knew about the inpatient unit, but she really resisted the idea. That changed one day when a hospice nurse came to visit. Well, when I first arrived, she had a caregiver in the home, and she was, they were both trying to bathe him. And it was a very difficult situation, and I could see how weakened he was and how hard she was trying to be the caregiver and the wife. I had to get in the shower with him, but he was just dead weight. You could no longer, he couldn't help you. And two of us couldn't do it. He's a large man. She's a small woman. And I could tell how physically and emotionally drained she was becoming. And I said, you can't do this alone. She said, let us take him over to the hospice unit at Evanston, and we will regulate his medications and get him comfortable, because he had gotten impacted. and." then we, he can come back home. And I said, no, because I promised him, that he, I promised myself, actually, that he would die at home. The more we talked and the more the situation escalated, um, she realized that she did need the help. Why was that hard for you, though, to... to, to Let to, him go there? Yeah. Because through all of this, I hoped he'd live. You know, your intelligence knows one thing, but your heart won't let him go. And with each step, I was letting him go. And I told her, um, Marlene, you can be the wife at, at, on the unit. You don't have to be the caregiver. You can just be in the role that you need to be in now and that your husband needs you to be. And we did, we went there. And I promised him I would stay with him. Most of us, I think, see death as the enemy, and we fight it till the end. For many doctors, when a patient dies, it can only be seen as a failure. In our culture, we look at life as if it were a straight line. And the longer the line, the more we imagine we have lived. But not everyone sees it that way. And then look at, I will be 85 soon. How long should a person live? See, <laughs> this is the truth. <laughs> you are not even half, I guess, this age. <laughs> so look, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ingeborg Rempel has emphysema. She doesn't seem that sick at first, but her doctor says she has less than six months to live. Inga lives in what they call an assisted living facility. That means she's got her own small apartment and comes to the dining room for meals. Well, I was a smoker, and this was bad. Yeah, I smoked all my life almost, and this I shouldn't, but I think it was nerves connected with the last war 
in Germany. It was a tough one, and I was home with my four children there. We didn't have much to eat. We stood in lines for a loaf of bread. It was tough, really tough. Yeah, this one is my two children in Germany. Mm -hmm. That's you and your two children? Yeah, 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 okay. for my first marriage. From your first marriage, where are they now? My son is in Germany. He is a professor. He was... After the war, Inga came to the United States with her husband and their children. These days, Inga doesn't see her children much. Two are in Germany, and the others moved from Chicago to California years ago. They are so busy with their shops and things like this that I would be in the way. Always on the go, always. And I mean, I can't help. Years ago, I was a great cook. I loved to cook. I loved to bake. This was a hobby I just loved. But I can't. So I would be in the way. They don't have time. No. Mm -mm. The shortness of breath, I think, is we're lucky that she's able to do as well as she does. Mm -hmm. This is the Horizon Hospice team meeting. Several times each week, the nurses, doctors, chaplains, social workers, and others sit around this table and discuss the care of each patient. Today, they're talking about Inga. She's really talking about how the decreased vision has affected her lately. Um, we're looking at ordering magnifiers to help her read a little bit better um, to improve her quality of life just a little bit. I'm very depressed oftentimes. Who wouldn't? You cannot see, you cannot walk the way you want, you cannot read. It is tough. I mean, it is tough. Inga, when I first met her in the hospital, was seriously ill. Uh, she had been through a uh, battle with a pneumonia and in the face of her end-stage lung disease had nearly died. We must be prepared that she will follow the course that we often see with emphysema, that she will be relatively stable and then suddenly have an intercurrent illness, usually an infection in her lungs, where then her life will be threatened uh, and she may uh, die. And there is not many years I hope to God. I pray in my really heart, let me go, because I don't know why they keep people so very long. This is what I don't understand. Our time is up. We had good days, we had bad days. We lived our life. Let the next generation come. Don't you think so? I think so. I really didn't know what to make of Inga. Here she was, eagerly, almost cheerfully, talking about wanting to die. I don't think I've ever been this charmed by someone who claimed to be so depressed. She knew that she had reached a point because of her lung disease and because of her severe disability from that, that her goals were no longer to have these lungs supported in any eventuality, but instead it was to make her lungs as good as we could with our relatively supportive therapy uh, or with what we call aggressive medical management. I began to wonder how Inga's care would be different if she weren't a hospice patient. You don't have to be in hospice to get good care. I think that a doctor who is caring and understands Inga's wishes could do a lot of the management uh, techniques that we use to see that uh, her care is not inappropriately invasive. If she were to get a pneumonia, then the instinctive response of the, the traditional medical system is to put her in a hospital, give her IV antibiotics, and treat the pneumonia. That is not necessarily what is best for Inga, as we understand Inga's wishes. Many people don't understand. When I see a new little, on my flower now, what was given to me, a new little leaf, I get excited. Maybe it's not the right thing, but it's just me. I'm thinking I'm a little too sensitive for this world. I love poems. Yeah. yeah. 
As I got to know these people, I began to realize that in our society, we don't typically prepare for death in the way that we prepare for other major events in our lives. We more or less deny its existence, even though nothing is more inevitable. Death is a taboo subject, even more taboo than sex, it seems. And most of all, when it comes to our own death, so in place of acceptance or understanding, we have fear and anxiety about what's ahead. Cancer is painful. That's, see, that's the thing that bothers me, because that's what everyone has said who's had it. It's very painful. Maybe not the cancer, but what it does to the other organs is very painful. Pain is probably the number one feared symptom of patients. Mo most folks will art articulate to you they're not so much afraid of dying, they're afraid of being in pain. And pain is a horrific experience you know, when you move and having these lancinating, gripping discomfort, and it gets in the way of life experiences. My mother-in-law had cancer for three years. And I mean, the pain was, this is a long time ago, 30 some years ago. And the pain was, I mean, I just don't want to go through that. It's not worth it. They kept her alive. Because they didn't do anything else at the time. The amazing thing is that it is possible. Uh, despite what uh, folks think, more than 95% of the time it's, it's possible to treat pain, get rid of it. The last 5%, the tougher cases, we might sacrifice what we say lucidity, that they may not be as clear-headed. You can always get rid of pain. They tell you not to worry. I mean, there's no problem. That, you know, they're not gonna restrict the amount that you need, which is important. If you need a lot, then they'll give you a lot. And, and they said some people go about doing whatever they're doing on a lot of morphine or whatever. They just go on and keep doing. So if I can do that, I would do that, you know. I hope I don't have to go on it for a long time. It is amazing how much you can liberate a soul when you control pain. I, I remember this incredible experience I had um, early in my years as a hospice doc. There, there was a gentleman at the, um, a nursing home who had a head and neck cancer. He had this big parotid tumor that invaded his mouth and he had a G-tube in. And um, he, I think he spoke Russian, so there was a language barrier. The nurses felt he was demented because he lay in the bed and kind of writhed around and he was just a mess all the time. And the hospice nurse had been called in because of this tumor and his c condition. And she said, you know, Martha, I think this guy's in pain. And he's because of his language barrier, because of his frailty, he's not able to communicate to us. And so I went down to see this guy. And, and we went, nurse and I put our heads together. And we started him on some medication through his G-tube. And the nurse went out to see him on Saturday. And I wasn't on duty that weekend. And you can imagine, I was a little bit on pins and needles thinking what happened to him. And, on Monday, first thing called to say, okay, what happened to Mr. So-and-so? And she said, you're not gonna believe this. She said, I walked in to the nursing home and his bed was empty. And she goes to the nurse's station. She says, did Mr. So-and-so die? And the nurse said, I don't think so. He's right over there. And she looked over and sitting by the door was this little man dressed, his hair combed, looking like he was ready to go out to dinner except they had this big parotid tumor, watching people go by. It was just the most incredible thing. He just liberated from this disheveled, impaired person in the bed to this person again. You know, when the baby boomers find out that 40 to 70 percent of Americans are dying in pain, things are going to change because people are just not going to accept 
this, you know, horrible state of affairs. A few weeks after my first visit with Leo, I went back to see him in the nursing home. I had heard his condition was getting worse, and that was clear before he even said a word. What I was not prepared for was the profound change in his spirit. My decline has really stepped up. I knew it was coming, but now I also know it's here. It's here, and I'm going to have to deal with that. Of all the conversations I had along the way, this was the hardest one. Especially in the hospice. I think that in my enthusiasm for the idea of a good death, I had lost sight of the fact that it is still death. We're still human, and it's hard to see the end closing in. The other three limbs, somehow or other, it still didn't discourage me. But now that I'm losing the last time, I, I hate to say it, but I really, I really am discouraged. I asked Leo what he had decided about getting a feeding tube to prolong his life. I have no interest in getting tube feeding. Until this conversation with Leo, I hadn't realized how much I had relied on him and the others to keep my spirits up. In some way, I needed them to be upbeat, or at least resigned to what was happening. And now, here was this man very honestly confronting just how difficult this was. I didn't choose this. The only thing I chose was that I don't didn't want to get into that bed and lie there like a festival. And that's where I'm headed. I don't want that. I don't want to know. You know, just let whatever's going to happen here happen. You know, don't, don't put a time on me. Don't tell me I got to go by the end of November. And uh, let it go at that. See what I can do, you know. You know, that, that carries over into the, the idea of not being resuscitated, and no extreme measures. I don't want it. I don't want to go back to a hospital and be uh, laying there dying anyway. If I'm going to die, let me die in my chair or, you know, at the kitchen table or whatever and let it be over, you know. How am I going to deal with this? You know, what's your first instinct if all of a sudden he, he just dropped on the floor? You know, your first instinct is, oh my God, I got to bring him back and he doesn't want to be brought back. How do you deal with that? If I go one time, I, I'm supposed to go. I just want to let it go at that, you know, I don't want to come back and now they have to put me in a corner over there and somebody has to watch me all day long to make sure I don't uh, draw on myself or fall out the window or anything. Once is enough. Mm -hmm. Mary. Hi. I got some medicine to help you relax. I first met Marlene when Bob was still living. They had been at the inpatient hospice unit for several days. Don't take anything by mouth for 10 minutes after I give you this. You don't have to swallow it. Bob's condition had gotten worse, and they no longer talked about bringing him back home. Okay, and I'll be back to see how he's doing.
Bob's daughter Vicky and her son were there all afternoon. Vicky's mom, Bob's first wife, had died a few years earlier, also of lung cancer. I asked her if her children were around when her mom died. Uh, my eldest, who was now 18, was, was around. Well, they were all around, all my children. But none of them came to the hospital at that point. It was just, I felt too scary a feeling for them. Um, this time, they've all been around, and the younger children that are now here have been felt comfortable climbing up on the bed and holding his hand or giving him a hug. It's just a totally different feeling. He was here four days. We were able to bathe him. We were able to do all this with him. And then the doctors came in, and they told me that there wasn't much time. That last night, everybody had gone home. Mm -hmm. And the nurse came in, and she said, Marlene, you have not left this room. You're not giving him permission to die. Mm -hmm. She said, you really need to let him know it's OK. And I said, but I am. I told him it was OK to go. She said, you don't mean it. Like 11:30 at night, so I said okay, and I went downstairs, and I went outside. It's God's honest truth. And I said, God, this is no longer about me. This is about Him. Please help me to let Him go. And as God is my witness, I felt like the building shook, hmm. and I ran upstairs, and He was still breathing okay. And I said, "Hon, it's okay. You can die. You can go and be at peace. And I promise you, I promise you that I will live and that I will take care of myself. And with that, I turned around and I've been there four days already. I started to pack some of our stuff up. And then I heard him breathing funny. And I turned around, and I just got on top of him, and he looked up at me, and he took his last breath in my arms. And I kept, I said, please, just breathe. I called the nurse, and she said, I'll give you your privacy. And for three hours, they let me lay with him. Our daughter Hannah was five when my father-in-law died in our home. Today she is 10, and she remembers her grandfather's death not as something profound or mysterious, but as a normal part of our family's life. Maybe that's the point. For so long, most of us have experienced death at a distance. We thought we were protecting ourselves or our children from the pain. I wonder now if that distance only increases the pain for us and for those who are dying. The people I met gave me an amazing gift. They let me and my cameraman into their lives and told us their stories. Though I don't know anymore if these are stories that can really be told. Maybe we hear a dying person's story just by being with them. I'm here by the here by the good love. Yeah. Real. Yeah. If it wasn't for him, what would I do? Mm -hmm. Where would I turn? From just savages to be alive, breathing today. Yeah. Every day. I don't again. know how long I'm gonna do this. Mm hmm It's true. But I hope it be for a long time. Yeah. Florence Lee did go home for about two and a half weeks, then came back to the hospice unit and died two days later. You know, when somebody dies, there's always somebody to bring up the question, well, he or she isn't suffering anymore. Is there at peace with the world? 
And that may be, I don't know, but I have full hope of being reunited with my wife. So that's one of the reasons I don't fear death. Leo Isaac died three weeks after our last interview. His son Jeff was with him. I could say it's a growth experience, but it's a lousy growth experience. It's really the worst you could possibly have. There's got to be better ways to see things in a better light than this way. But you just can't let it take you over. You just can't. Phyllis Weiner went to Hawaii for 10 days soon after our interview. When she came back, she sounded good, but told me that she knew it was the home stretch. She died at home less than a month later. No, when it's over, it's over. You have to face it. There's no other way. Yeah. Inga Rempel lived for two months after our interview and died the day after Christmas. It seems like I've out outlived their estimates. <laughs> but Any I, idea I why? keep fooling them. Any idea why? Yeah. God isn't done with me yet. Miles Eddy lived for another six months, just long enough to see this program completed. He died at home two weeks later. Produced in Chicago by WTTW.